You're listening to the North Parkway Podcast, weekly talks designed to help you take the next step in your spiritual journey. You can learn more about our church at northparkway.org. And if these talks are helpful to you, consider using the link in the description to give. Your financial support helps us continue to make great content. All right, well, that's enough intro. Let's get to today's talk. Years ago, there was a popular movie called Vantage Point. And the premise was they would show you a terrorist attack and replay the same event over and over, but they would show it to you from different perspectives of the people in the crowd. One was a head of security. Another was a tourist who happened to have a camcorder with him. Another was an obvious looking suspect. And it made you wonder, did he really have something to do with it or not? And it was a great illustration to show that the same event can take on a very different character depending on your point of view. Last week we looked at this beautiful story where Jesus stops a crowd full of people to minister to one woman right in the middle of her mess. Someone who was unclean and by all the rules, Jesus should have pushed her away. But instead, he welcomes her in. It was a wonderful illustration of how Jesus steps into each of our messes to welcome us in instead of pushing us out. And God's grace is awesome and it's big and it's bigger than any mess. But dealing with grace is a messy business. Extending grace to messy people is a messy business. And what I want to look at today is the same story from a different perspective. Because when we look at it closely, you're going to see not everybody was excited about the way Jesus handled the situation with that woman. Mark chapter 5 is where we talked last week, is where we're going to dive right back in, same spot today. You can follow along on the screens, or if if you want to use the Bible app. By the way, the Bible app is awesome. If you don't have it, uh, that's also on the links page. You can download that. It's free. I love it. The Bible says this, starting in verse, uh, let's see, 22, um, that a leader of the local synagogue, so Jesus comes across the lake, gets off the boat, a leader of the local synagogue whose name was Jairus arrived. When he saw Jesus, he fell at his feet, pleading fervently with him, My little daughter is dying, he said. Please, come lay your hands on her and heal her so she can live. Today, I want to look at this story from the perspective of Jairus, the dad whose girl is dying. Let me me draw your attention to a couple of words because these are going to be important in just a minute. He's pleading fervently. He says, you need to come right now, Jesus. I want you to make sure you understand. So Jesus, you you ever had this, parents? Do you ever come home and before you can even get out of the car, the kid's ready to ask you something, right? Can I go play? Can I I watch this? Can I have a snack? Can you unlock the door? Because you forgot to, okay, whatever it is. That Okay, Jesus gets off of the boat and this guy's been waiting. Okay, and the moment that Jesus steps off, he's, he's, Hey, dude, I need your help right now. Why? Because he's a dad and his daughter is dying. Really big deal. Any parents in the room, grandparents in the room, big brothers or big sisters, aunts and uncles, right? 12-year-old that you love and is close to you is dying and you have one chance. You're going to be really invested in what's going on, okay? Very important, very big deal. He said, Jesus, you got to come right now. So verse 24, Jesus went with him, and all the people followed, crowding around him. A woman in the crowd had suffered for 12 years with constant bleeding. We talked about her last week. If you missed last week, definitely go back and watch. This is kind of a two-part deal. Uh, the, the short version is she was an outcast in society. She had no chance to be physically healed or to be welcomed in to society and to her culture. And Jesus went past all of the red tape. And brought healing to her. Here's how that happened. Verse 27. She had heard about Jesus, so she came up behind him through the crowd and touched his robe. For she thought to herself, if I can just touch his robe, I will be healed. Immediately the bleeding stopped, and she could feel in her body that she had been healed of her terrible condition. Jesus realized at once that healing power had gone out from him. 
So he turned around in the crowd and asked, who touched my robe? Now, I just want to remember, we're looking at it from a different perspective. Last week, we focused on this girl, and she needed the Savior, and she went through the crowd, and she got him. But today, I want you to put yourself in in the perspective. I want you to to look at this through Jairus' eyes. Imagine, Jesus comes off the boat. This guy comes running up to Jesus, falls to his knees. Teacher, you have to come. My daughter is dying. Please, I'm desperate for your help. What speed do you think that the crowd was moving at toward Jairus' house? Pretty quick, right? Pretty quick. They, they were not, it wasn't a leisurely stroll and they're just talking and Jesus is popping grapes in his mouth as he's going. They're cracking jokes. And he's like, I need a bathroom break. Okay, cool, man. Let's just stop here. Okay. They were in a hurry. This girl is dying. He's been waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting because someone said, I think Jesus is coming across the water and he's looking out for him. He's like, yes, that's him in the boat. Okay. So when Jesus, this woman pushes through the crowd and touches Jesus, and Jesus stops the whole thing and turns around and said, wait a minute, pause, who just touched me? We need to deal with an issue right now. I'm getting nervous if I'm the dad and my daughter is dying. And it gets worse. Okay, Jesus spins around, who touched my robe? His disciples said to him, look at this crowd pressing around you. How can you ask who touched me? But he kept, it, listen, he kept on looking around to see who had done it. It's a little bit different when you are the dad and you are sweating bullets and you know the clock is ticking back home and I don't know how much longer my girl has and this is the only hope for her. And not only did he stop for a moment, but he's like, no, I'm not going anywhere until I figure out who it is that touched my robe. And we talked about this a little bit last week. See, Luke's gospel mentions that it was like a process of elimination where one by one people were like, wasn't me, wasn't me, wasn't me, wasn't me, wasn't me. And finally, after they looked at everybody, the the woman who had snuck through the crowd, they finally realized it is her. That takes time. And if I'm Jairus, I'm getting nervous. I'm getting upset. I don't know who this lady is. But I, I don't know if you realize I'm kind of in a hurry right now. Well, it's worse because the woman wasn't just someone who was sick. It was someone who was unclean who pushed through the crowd to touch Jesus. See, Jairus is the leader of the synagogue. It's his job to every week get people together and open up the scrolls and read from the Old Testament. It's his job to teach people about how to be clean about how to follow the rules, about how to make God happy with your life by doing things the right way. This guy knows really well what just happened. What just happened was, I needed the teacher to come and heal my daughter, and this lady just pushed through the crowd, not only took the time, but now he's unclean. And he's disqualified for service. How are you feeling in that moment if you're the dad? Let me put it in modern terms, okay? Your 12-year-old daughter is dying, and you call 911, and you're like, I need an ambulance out here, stat. I I can't fix this, and if I don't get her to the hospital soon, she's going to die. And they bring an ambulance out to your house, and they load her up in the ambulance, and you're driving to the hospital, and somebody steps out into the middle of the road and waves down the ambulance. And it pulls over and stops. Can I help you, ma'am? Yeah, I need some help. Okay, well, well, let's just put it in park. And, okay, and they bring her into the ambulance and they're like dealing with her stuff. And then it turns out she has AIDS. How are you feeling in that moment? Not good. Really bad. I can't imagine the things that were going through Jairus' mind here when this happens. And it's bad enough, it's a bad situation that takes a dark turn in verse 35. The disciples who were there wrote the things down that they saw, and they recorded this. While Jesus was still speaking to her, that's the woman who pushed through the crowd, messengers arrived from the home of Jairus, the leader of the synagogue. They told him, your daughter is dead. There's no use troubling the teacher now. Mm. 
Now, you're feeling a lot of things in that moment, and probably shock is the most important one of those. It's the one that you, you feel the most. I volunteered for a couple of years with, um, with the coroner's office, and uh, when you first hear that someone you love has died, shock is the main one. But something else that goes along with that a lot of times is anger. Do you imagine how angry you would be if you were the dad and this woman just came and did all of this stuff? I'm, I'm in shock. I'm in grief. Um, I, I'm dismayed. I'm super discouraged. But I'm also ready to deal with this lady who just, it's your fault. What did you do? And it's into this moment that Jesus says a word that is so powerful. He says the word to this woman, but I want you to see it from a different perspective. We talked about this last week. It's the only time recorded in Scripture where Jesus ever addresses someone by this term. It's unique. It's special. The disciples who were there took note of it, and they wrote it down so that thousands of years later we could look at this and glean truth from it. Jesus, verse 34, Jesus turns to the woman and says to her, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. Your suffering is over. He called her daughter. Now, last week, we talked about how that was important for this woman because she was terrified of Jesus because she knew she broke the rules. And in that moment, Jesus calls her daughter. She knows and she has peace to know, okay, he's not looking at me right now as a judge. He's looking at me as a father figure. But I want you to think about who else is in the crowd. Jesus is always so intentional with his words. And Jairus, the dad, who's just, he's, okay, verse 34. I've read them to you out of order. Verse 34, he says, daughter. And right after that, this guy finds out that his daughter has just died. And there's something so powerful in what Jesus says. And I don't want you to miss this. He's implying to him, hey, this is a daughter too. This is somebody's daughter too. I know that your daughter is dying, but so is this daughter, and I see her too. There's something powerful there that we can miss so easily, and if you have fill-in-the-blank notes, I want you to write this down. Messy people are sons and daughters too. And they need love from the Father, just like people who do things the right way, just like people who go through the right process, just like people who put in their due. Messy people who jump to the front of the line are sons and daughters too. Now, I want to be careful here. I, I'm going to say the word messy a lot, I, and I don't mean physically messy. I don't mean smelly people. I used to work for Toys R Us, and there were a few people uh, who would come in sometimes to shop, and you could tell, even without looking, that they came in because from like 30 feet away, there was a unique fragrance that entered the room. Some of you guys know what, okay? You know what that's like. That's nobody here, okay? There are plenty of people who, on the outside, physically, they've got it all put together. They've got the makeup just right, and the hair just right, and they've got the shoes just right, and everything, their life from anybody on looking on the outside would look like they've got things going on well and they've got it figured out. But on the inside, in their soul, it's messy. And messy people are sons and daughters too. Messy people have a seat at the table too. Some of you guys know all about that because that's been you. And when it comes to the moral state of people, on this live stream and in this room, here's something else that you can write down, okay? Some have it mostly together. Some are a hot mess, but all, 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 all belong here. There's a seat for everybody at the table. There's a place for everyone who comes to Jesus and said, Jesus, I need your help. Listen, both of these people... Jairus came begging Jesus, please help. The woman came desperate for help. They both came to the right place. And what's amazing and what's so good and I'm so relieved to see is that they both got the help that they needed. Mark 5, verse 40. Jesus, the Bible says, took the girl's father, that's Jairus, 
Okay, this is after the report. Hey, don't bother the teacher anymore. She's dead. It's too late. Jesus took the girl's father and mother and his three disciples into the room where the girl was lying. Holding her hand, he said to her, Talitha kum, which means little girl, get up. And the girl, who was 12 years old, immediately stood up and walked around. They were overwhelmed and totally amazed. Okay. It's a good ending for everybody. Jesus still goes and heals Jairus' daughter. And there's something powerful that we see there. He was concerned with both. Jesus had compassion on and mercy for and healing for the one who did stuff right. Because you've got to remember... If you were a synagogue leader, okay, that's their version of a local church pastor. Here's a guy who has devoted his life to serving God and doing his best to make God pleased with his life the best way that he can. He's devoted his life to teaching other people to love God and to put God first. Jairus is not a bad guy in scripture. Sometimes the local synagogue leaders were opposed to Jesus. Not this guy, he was a believer. He did everything the right way. And God said, I see you. This other girl did everything the wrong way. She broke all of the social norms and rules. And God said, I see you. And it's, it's really easy. We come to the modern day. We look at God's family, this gathering of people here, to, to, to get out of balance with who we're actually trying to reach, what we're actually here for. I spent years when I was a young minister kind of debating this. And, and at first, as a young person, I was totally on the side, oh, church, church is not for Christians. Church is for the unsaved. You guys are already going to heaven, so you don't need any consideration. It's all about the people who've never been here before. It's 100%. It's all for those who don't know the Lord. So just, you know, you had your time, Grandpa, to kick to the curb, and this is all, okay. But then I'd read through Scripture, and I said, wait a minute, wait a minute. A big part of what we do here every Sunday is equipping those who have Jesus in their hearts, who serve him, and training, training people up who are Christians to be able to share the good news outside of these walls. The most effective witness isn't the one from this guy on the stage, it's the one from you. So wait a minute, okay. And so then I flipped and I said, no, 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 church on Sunday morning, church is really just for the Christians. That's what we need. All of the focus needs to be on there. And the reality is, God loves both. This has to be a place for people who are who have been serving the Lord for a long, long time. This needs to be a place for people who just recently made a commitment to serve God with their lives. This is a place for people who have been thinking about this and you're kind of, I'm kind of curious about whether there's something to this God thing. I'm checking it out. It's a place for people who are like, dude, I don't even want to be here, but my mom is making me, so fine, I'm here. It's a place for everybody. And I want to talk a little bit to both groups, the, the seasoned Christians and the, and the new Christians today. Because we both have a seat at the table, but we both need to do the things that God's put in front of us to do. The, the first group I want to talk to is new Christians. Write this down in your notes. New Christian, your job is to learn and grow. Your job is to learn and grow. And I understand all of us have that responsibility. We all need to learn and grow. It's not saying that, you know, well, once you've been here as long as Dave and Glinda, you got it all figured out. You don't need to grow anymore, right? We know better, okay? You guys know them? Definitely growth potential. <laughs> Just kidding. Yeah, right? I see some knowing nods back there. Um, but if you're new to serving God with your life, you soak things in like a sponge. Your job right now is to learn and to grow. Being adopted into God's family is instant, but taking on his character is, is a long process. The Bible records this, Ephesians chapter 4, and this is an instruction to church as a whole, but it's especially meaningful if you're new to this whole deal. Paul says this, therefore I, Paul, a prisoner for serving the Lord, I beg you, lead a life worthy of your calling. For you have been called 
by God. I want you to think, and we talked about it during the worship time. I want you to think about the cost that was that your salvation was to God. The price that was paid so that he could offer forgiveness to you. We sang it earlier. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Christ. Jesus died to offer forgiveness to you. It reminds me of this moment at the end of the movie uh, Saving Private Ryan. And in summary, it's, it's a World War II story and this whole group of guys goes in f- to save one individual. And at the very end of the movie, one of those guys from the group is looking at the man that they saved. We have that, yeah. He looks at him and he says, earn this. Live up to this. Tell me that I didn't give my life to save you for nothing. Make your life matter for something. Listen, all of us have a responsibility to live up to the calling that God has, that God has put in our lives. To the cost. When I consider the cost of my salvation, I owe everything to him. And God is amazingly patient with you. If you're new here, God is not looking for an opportunity to boot you out, but I do want you to consider this, write this down. Jesus didn't die to leave you in your mess. He offers you a fresh start, but but he wants to help you to step out of that stuff. Not because, well, you know, I, I need to be a perfectionist. No, it's because the broken way of living around us brings pain. It brings suffering. It brings hardship. And God wants something better for you. He wants something better for your family. He wants something better for the generations that are going to come after you, that are going to learn from you. So, new Christians, what I want you to do is pick up your textbook, right? And be ready to learn. Starts with simple things. Like, read the Bible. (laughs) I know. It's like the most basic stuff. But honestly, legitimately, okay? If you're here and you're like, you know, actually, I've never actually read the whole thing. You, you really should, right? We're getting tested on this later, okay? <laughs> There's a test. You should read it. It's good stuff. The Bible helps us to get to know who God is. You got to read it. If you're new, that means you need, to, you need to sign up for Growth Track so that you can learn about places to connect with other believers in this room. You need to find a place where you can serve so you can, so you can grow in that area. You need to come, okay? Every Wednesday night at 6 o'clock, we have a group of people who get together and pray. And, and we, set, we schedule it in a way that if you're like, I don't really know what to pray about for 45 minutes, we walk you through it step by step. It is not a group for elites. It's a group for For folks who know what they're doing and folks who are like, I don't even know if I can pray for five minutes without falling asleep. If you're new to Christianity, you really should come. Okay, Come to celebrate recovery on Thursday nights. Come to to Wednesday night Bible studies at 7. You need to plug into the life of the church so that you can grow. Okay, So new Christians, your job is to learn and grow. Write this down. Mature Christians, your job is to patiently help others (laughs) to grow. Everybody say patiently. Okay. Everybody say patiently really slowly. Patiently. Right? Patiently. It's important. It's a functional word in there. Your job is to patiently help others to grow. Okay? The very next verse. So we just read, live a life worthy of your calling. Very next verse. Be patient with each other. And listen to this. Okay? Man. Some pockets of the American church need this so badly. We have messed this up. Be patient with other, each other, making allowance for each other's faults because of your love. Make every effort to keep yourself united in the spirit, binding yourselves together with peace, for there's one body and one spirit, just as you've been called to one glorious hope for the future. You have to patiently bear with one another's faults because they're part of the family too. My wife's family, okay, Natasha has two brothers who were uh, brothers by birth. She had several other brothers and sisters who were foster brothers and sisters. It puts a weird strain on the family when you've got the kids who all grew up together and all of a sudden you bring another one in who doesn't know the family rules, who doesn't 
speak with the same family language, who doesn't know that you don't do this at the table and you don't do that at the table. Okay? But we who have been serving the Lord for a while, we must bear with one another with patience and make allowances for one another's faults because of our love. Listen, if, if you are a church veteran, you need to be ready get the mop bucket out because inviting people in who morally, morally, morally are messy, it's a messy business. You're going to have this and you have to be patient. Write this down. You can't expect baby Christians to act like grown-ups overnight. It didn't happen for you. And the people who were the people who were around you, the spiritual mentors in your life did not boot you out when you messed stuff up. You got to be patient. Reminds me of years ago, my, my oldest son, Ethan, was four, and we had a vacation Bible school at our church. Anybody ever go to vacation Bible school back in the day? Yeah, VBS, right? Uh, also known as free babysitting, right? FBS, free babysitting. They're going to feed my kids some cookies and those little uh, Kool-Aid jugs, right? Yes, the generic Walmart Oreos. That's what we had, okay? And, and so Ethan had gone to VBS, and at the end of the week, there was a prize giveaway, and I don't remember what it was. I think it was a bicycle or something. It was a really big, cool prize. One lucky kid is going to get their name drawn, and they're going to win a prize. So they drum roll, brrr, and they pull out the name, and it was not Ethan Clark. And at four years old, he was so disappointed. So he really wanted that prize, so he was disappointed. You're like, yeah, okay, sorry, kid. You know, get him next time, slugger. And then we, we get in the car, and I buckle him into the car seat. And at four years old, he's still talking about it. And he's still frustrated. And he's, it's not fair. And I should have had that. And as a dad who's tuned in to, like, we're not going to be this way, I was suddenly very firm with my son. And I'm like, hey, that is a bad attitude. We are not going to have that attitude. That is... You know, and, and I started, okay, I started laying into him. And as I was talking, do you ever have this? As I was talking, the Holy Spirit speaks to me as the words are coming out of my mouth. And he says, hey, why are you rebuking him? You never taught him that in the first place. It's your job to teach him first before you correct him. Dad, it's your job to teach him the right way. Why are you holding him to this standard when he's never learned it before? And I said, oh, God, I'm sorry. You're right. And how often do we do that in church? We take baby Christians and we say, this is the standard, live by it. And when in three weeks they don't live by it, we say, I don't know if that one's going to take. I don't think they really love Jesus at all. What? What? What are we doing? We can't be that way. As experienced Christians, we can't be that way. Listen, this is, this is the pathway. This is how things work here. We don't start people and say, okay, the pathway to being part of us belongs with, it, it, it starts with, you need to be just like Jesus. And if you're just like Jesus, then, then you can be part of our group. That, none of us start that. Being part of our family just starts with, if you want to be part of us, you can come and belong. If if you're still figuring out whether or not you believe that God is actually out there, we're glad you're here. If you're like, I don't really know if I believe in this stuff, but I like hanging out with these people and free coffee and donuts is fun, I'm glad you're here. Listen, it starts with just being part of us. And then I believe that if you're around us long enough, eventually you're going to come to that point where you say, you know what, I do believe in this, and I do want God in my life. And then becoming like Jesus begins in your life. Galatians 6.1, similar idea, different book in the Bible, says, Dear brothers and sisters, if another believer is overcome by some sin... You who are godly, okay, that's you guys who are doing this right, who are, have a strong relationship, should gently and humbly help that person back onto the right path. Now, pastor, isn't there a passage about if someone's living in sin, you need to excommunicate them? Yes. And there is a place, I don't want you to get this wrong, there is a place for church discipline 
But that is like the last step. That is the final. So many people in church, we go straight to like level 10 punishment. And you're like, wait a minute. Did you ever actually patiently walk through this with somebody and teach them the right way? Or are you just, we, we got to do it right. Okay, let me show you how that does not work. Okay, patiently and gently helping people back onto the path. It does not mean that the first sign of trouble, we throw them out like they're in a wild western saloon. Okay, I, I've been part of that. Maybe some of you guys have felt that. That is not how we should do things. Uh, you know, Pastor, I was on Facebook the other day and I saw a picture of Joanne and she had a Bud Light in her hand. I think we need to kick her out of the church. Like, okay, calm down. Have you talked to them? Hey, are you okay? Oh, I think they're an alcoholic. What, you, from one picture? You determined that? Okay. okay. We, that's not, that is not our character. That's not who we are. Okay? That's not the way. And gently and humbly, it also doesn't mean that we stand from the sidelines and we shout at them, you are wrong. You're going to hell, sinner. Okay? Not helpful. That's not helpful. Here, here's what it means. It means that if we see in somebody else behavior that is, that is leading, that, that is sin, something that's leading them to hurt their family or hurt themselves or hurt the church community, that instead of kicking them out or shouting at them, we go and walk side by side with them and we say, hey man, can we talk about this? There's, I don't know if you realize the damage, the way that you're talking to your wife is crushing her spirit. And God has an expectation for husbands to speak gently and kindly to their wife. I don't know if you realize, but the way that you're talking about your husband when he's not around is cutting him down. You're cutting him off at the knees. And God has an expectation for wives to, to speak about their husbands with honor and to, and to have integrity, okay? That's a totally different thing when you're shoulder to shoulder. And this friend of mine, Rusty Rayleigh, used to always say a rebuke only goes as deep as the relationship. If I've just met you and you're telling me how to live my life, that's gonna bounce off me like rubber bullets off of a tank. It's not getting anywhere. Okay? But if someone who is invested in my life, who I have friends with, who knows my family, who knows my story, who knows the story behind the picture that somebody saw on Facebook, if they come and put their arm around me and say, listen, Chris, I'm concerned about you, man. This is... You, you keep saying it's one drink, but it's always six by the time you're done, and you're going to end up hurting yourself. You're going to end up hurting somebody else. You're going to spend all of your money on booze instead of saving for retirement. I'm worried about you. Can we talk about that? That's a totally different deal. That must be us. Because I don't want to have an uncomfortable conversation when I get to heaven because I, my name's written in the book of life. I don't want to get... I don't want to stand before God. And God says, Chris, I'm glad you're here. Welcome in, son or daughter. But I hung on the cross and died for this person to bring them into my family. And you pushed them away. Why did you do that? Do you have any idea how hard it was for me to get them to believe that they had value inside of them? Do you have any idea, Chris, how hard it was for me to convince them that I am here and that I love them and that I accept them? And then the moment that I brought them in, you who were already there, who were comfortable and didn't like them cramping your style, made a point to point out all of their flaws and push them away. Why did you do that? I don't want that conversation. We're going to mess stuff up. We're going to get it wrong, but we need to get it right more often than we get it wrong. And I want this to be a place where messy people and people who are messy and don't realize it, people and people who are kind of on the path and people who are one step from their eternal reward in heaven and practically glowing in sainthood but still imperfect, I want all of those people to have a place here in this family because God loves all his sons and daughters. Watch this. When I was a kid, my dad pastored a small church in rural Arkansas. And after a little while there, we started focusing on youth ministry. We brought in a youth pastor and we had Sunday night services where we would invite teenagers from around the community to come join us. 
And they actually did. And the beautiful thing is when they came and they heard the gospel, teenagers who were completely spiritually lost began to open up their hearts to Jesus and be saved. They got so excited that they started bringing their friends and this thing quickly picked up momentum. We had a large number for a small church, a large number of teenagers coming and getting saved and learning about God every Sunday night. The problem was they were a little bit of a rough crowd. Okay? These were unchurched teens. They would come in uh, ripped jeans with tattoos and piercings and get all the way down to the front row. They would put out their cigarette butts on the front porch of the church and that you could smell the substance abuse on them from several rows away. After one of these Sunday night services, one of the board members pulled my dad aside and, and he said, Pastor, when are you going to start bringing in the good kids? Hmm. The good kids. You can almost hear echoes of Jairus' rebuttal when Jesus stops to minister to the woman in the crowd. Wait, what about my daughter? What about the one who hasn't messed things up? What about the one who's not unclean? She needs your help too. And the truth is she does. Good kids, church kids need Jesus, but so do the ones who don't know how to act in church. So do the ones who don't know how to dress in church. So do the ones who have worldviews that stand in opposition to the gospel. They need grace too. Jesus was very clear when he was here on earth about his mission. He came as a doctor to help the sick, not the ones who were well. He came focused on those who knew they needed repentance, not those who thought they had it all figured out. And if we're his representatives to our culture and our time, don't you think we should have the same character? Don't you think we should take the same approach? God loved both daughters in the story. God loves church kids who have grown up and try to do things the right way. God loves kids who have never even heard there is a gospel and come from broken homes and broken worldviews. And God wants to reach all of them. But I want you to take a minute and think. Think about God as a father. Think about the lost sons and daughters, those who are spiritually lost, who are in this community. If God wants to bring them to a place for them to hear the gospel and for them to grow spiritually, what kind of place would that look like? Would it be a place with a white carpet mentality that says, fix yourself, clean yourself up before you come into the Lord's house. We do everything right here and we have a... Uh, no, 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 no. No, it wouldn't be that at all. I think God as a father is looking for places where he can send lost sons and daughters where they will be accepted right where they are, but they will be encouraged to grow into something better than where they are, where their mess will not push them away, but they'll find people who are patient enough to walk side by side with them as God slowly, systematically, in his timing, produces righteousness in them. Friends, we have to be that kind of place. I want to be a church where God looks throughout the community of Pekin and says, there, that is a place I can trust these people that if I send my lost children to them, they will be nurtured, they will be encouraged, and they will be able to grow spiritually. You have to remember, we all stepped into the family of God. Messy. We're all in need of grace. We all have a responsibility having received God's grace to now turn and offer grace to the people around us who need the help the most. So new Christians, get out your school books and be ready to learn. Mature Christians, get out your mop buckets and be ready to serve. And let's be a place where all of God's sons and daughters can find healing and forgiveness and new life. Hey, this is Pastor Chris again. Thanks for listening. If today's talk was helpful in your spiritual life, odds are there's someone you know who could benefit from it. Take a minute right now to share it with them. And if you live in the area, come try out a service in person because church is more fun with friends. See you next time.